according to the Christian calendar, especially in the West, uh, today is called uh, the Trinity Sunday. Last week it was called Pentecost. Today is the Trinity Sunday. From next week onwards, the ordinary period starts. So we have celebrated uh, Christmas, Epiphany. We, celeb we uh, meditated the passion of Jesus Christ. We meditated death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. We celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. And we celebrated the ascension of Jesus. And we celebrated descending of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And today is called the Sunday, or it is called the Trinity Sunday. We can also call it Mystery Sunday. The greatest mystery that Christian theology speaks about, a philosophy can speak about, any logic that can speak about, is the doctrine of Trinity. And as a congregation, we had our, our own background. Once upon a time, we were people who were denying the Trinity. And later, we understood the importance of the doctrine of Trinity. I guess almost for 20 plus, 20 plus years, we closely studied the doctrine of Trinity. And what is the doctrine of Trinity, how it works and all, that's what we are exploring. How the doctrine of Trinity influences our lives, that's what we are experiencing as a Christian life today. So we had enough experience, enough, you might have heard enough messages, enough lessons about the doctrine of Trinity. So much of theology was already there. No matter how many messages we heard, no matter how many teachings we heard, no matter how much theology we heard about the doctrine of Trinity, still <coughs> it remains as a mystery. Still there are a lot of things that we won't be able to comprehend. That does not mean we won't learn. Throughout eternity, if somebody asked me, what are you going to do in heaven throughout eternity? Some people said, your, your people are going to worship and all. Definitely we may be worshipping. You know, we worship when we know the beauty of God. So what we are going to do throughout eternity is we are going to learn the nature of God. We are going to explore the depths of the nature of God. We are going to explore the depths of the love of God. As we are learning, we cannot help but worship Him. That would be happen, happening in heaven. This is just a speculation. This is how I am thinking. And uh, God has given us minds. We can think creatively. Well, you know, you have that freedom to do that. Okay. Having said that, today I am not going to talk about again the theology of Trinity because I know you heard a lot and I don't want to uh, trouble you with that again. However, I would like to make few comments on that and then later we, uh, I would like to um, uh, speak about the mystery of Trinity and how we can uh, accept it and how we should handle it. The doctrine of Trinity is based on basically two things from the Bible. Number one, God loves. And number two thing, God spoke. These are the two foundations on which the doctrine of Trinity is based. I'm not, I'm not, as, I say, as I said, I'm not going to talk about uh, the doctrine of Trinity, the logical aspect of it. But overall in Bible, the doctrine of Trinity makes sense and we are talking about it because of these two points. Number one is God loves. Number two is God spoke. If we say that God loves, before he creating any of us, was he loving? And Bible also claims that God not just loves, but he is love in himself. How, he can, how can he be love in himself if he is... <coughs> Single person, monotheistic God, which we technically we call monad monotheism. If, he is God, if God is only one person, how can he be love? If God should to be love, there should be more than one person. So there is a person who is loving and there is another person who is receiving that love and there is a medium where the love is being exchanged. That is where the doctrine of Trinity comes and tells God is three persons and one God. 
If God is not three persons and one God, God cannot be love. God will be a desperate, um, you know, needful, lonely being. But the doctrine of Trinity says that God is not like that. God create God love. God is love in Himself. So, which leads us to the implications that tells God did not create you and me out of His need. If he is only one person, he doesn't have anyone to fellowship or to express his love or mercy. That's why he created. That's, that shows God is in need of somebody. Out of desperation, he created. But the doctrine of Trinity teaches us that God did not create us out of desperation. But he created us out of fullness of his love. His love is overflowing. There is great love in himself. God is perfect. God is perfect love. Perfect love cannot grow anymore. And perfect love can be only shared. That's why God being the perfect love, He created us so that we may be able to share in His love. Those are the implications of the doctrine of Trinity. And number two line, number two main, uh, main reason why we, we got the doctrine of Trinity from the Bible is because God spoke these two the Bible makes these two claims. God spoke. What is the most repeated word in the Bible? Do you know? You know what is the most repeated word Bible? Word in the Bible? The Lord said. The Lord spoke. In the beginning, Genesis chapter one, verse one, it said, God said. It starts with that. From there till the book of Revelation, everywhere we will find the word, the Lord says. Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Our God, our God of the Bible is a God who speaks. If God wants to be someone who speaks, where was he speaking before the creation? He was speaking among himself. That's where the doctrine of Trinity comes again. If God speaks, that means there should be somebody who is speaking and there should be somebody who is receiving that speech and there should be somebody who interprets that word. If God has to be, uh, God, ha God should be speaking, then let me repeat. Uh, there should be somebody who is speaking and there should be something called spoken thing, the word. Okay, can you connect the words from the Bible? And there should be somebody who is interpreting that word because the word cannot be inter they cannot be it cannot be understood directly because it's a divine word a word of high language that's where the doctrine of trinity comes again god the father is the one who is speaking the word jesus himself is the word that he has spoken and holy spirit is the one who is interpreting that word and through him alone we are able to understand the word of, word of God. That's why Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians and says, he says that no one knows what is in the mind of people and definitely no one knows what is in the mind of God except the Spirit of God. He alone can interpret what the Word of God says. So if we are studying the Word Bible, if we are understanding the Word of God, if we are looking at Jesus, we can understand the Word of God even the person word of God and the scripture word of God only by the Holy Spirit. So that's where the doctrine of Trinity plays again very major role. So on these two claims, the doctrine of Trinity has come. And when we think about this doctrine of Trinity, logically we can give so many analogies, so many explanations, explaining uh, philosophically, mathematically, you know, in uh, metaphysically, in so many ways we explain that. But no matter what we explain, still it is a mystery. Having said that, I would like to move into the direction I wanted to take today uh, as we talk about the mystery of the Trinity. The direction I wanted to take is trying to understand the beauty through which we may try to understand how should we handle the knowledge of the Trinity or the beauty of the Trinity. Beauty. What is beauty? What is beauty? 
and somebody gave a definition saying beauty is a combination of qualities such as shape color or form that pleases the aesthetic senses especially the sight so there should be a form color shape if they are properly arranged then it is called beauty on somebody said beauty is commonly described as a feature of objects that makes these objects pleasurable okay pleasurable to perceive so when we look at something if it gives us joy it gives us pleasure that is something called beauty and thomas aquinas a great theologian uh, he says that uh, beauty is that which is pleases in the very apprehension of it so there are some things when we understand it that will give us pleasure you know if you understand the law of conservation of energy intermediate first people first year people will be very happy so that is the beauty of law of conservation of energy anything a mystery if you understand that can give you a happiness and joy and that means that can be beauty again and when we talk about beauty there are two groups of people they uh, they uh, they speak about beauty number one group of people are called sub subjectivists and number two group of people are called objectivists and the subjectivist people uh, they they have a theor theory and they they come to consider them their theory as a subjectivism and they say beauty depends on the mind that perceives okay or we say beauty depends on the beholder it it's all in you it, how you are looking at things based on that beauty will be there that's why some people like the some people like certain thing and other people may not like that the choice the desire the taste this is what the word we use regularly you don't have good taste you don't have aesthetic taste you have aesthetic ta taste you know good color co you know good color combination that's why ladies take all the other ladies to shopping to ch to pick up the right color right matching thing am i right uh, you know it is there so beauty is depends on the beholder each person has a different perspective different taste for the beauty and that is where the problem is again okay it is if you consider it subjective um it depends completely on the mind that perceives you know have you ever seen any video of niagara falls it's a great beautiful thing and we we all wish to go and uh, see niagara falls uh, right we all wish to go and uh, just imagine if a fellow put uh, his tea stall at niagara falls and he is watching it regularly and if you go and say wow itna sundar hai what a beautiful place it is then he must be thinking in himself ye kya pani to gir raha hai kya hai isme you know so it's 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 on the perspective so does it mean if somebody somebody could if they could not perceive the beauty will be vanished from that particular thing if beauty is subjective each person has a different perspective about the beauty some people like a yeah, niagara falls for the other person it is just waste of water falling down 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 where what's the purpose we don't know so does it make the beauty of the niagara falls any less no there is a beauty which is beyond what these people can perceive beauty does not depend on people who are perceiving only the joy of the beauty comes to the people who perceive it the difference comes is with the joy not with the beauty okay and the, the other group of people are called objectivist they they say that beauty is a mind independent feature of things it's a mind independent thing it's not it's not limited to any perception the beauty like for example the beauty of a landscape is independent of who perceives it or whether it is perceived at all or not just as i said about the niagara falls disagreements may be explained by an inability to perceive this feature sometimes referred to, uh, sometimes referred to as a lack of taste so the tapri walon ko hum bolenge you don't have any taste for the beauty okay beauty is both but, but the reality is beauty is both objective and 
subjective. It is seen as a proper property of things, but also as depending on the emotional response of the observer. So it is a property of a thing. It will not be affected by people who are observing, but at the same time, the pleasure of it is completely dependent on the observer. Having said that, I would like to bring another quote from one of the philosophers from the uh, history, Aristotle. Aristotle said, beauty, for him literally, beauty literally is like this. Beauty is the chief, uh, sorry, the chief form of beauty are order and symmetry and definiteness, de definiteness which the mathematical science demonstrate in this uh, special degree. He says in metaphysics, okay, there's even a beauty formula, the golden ratio, a set of proportions found in nature and applied by man to all manner of visual culture. According, no need to remember everything, very simple thing. According to Aristotle, beauty depends on symmetry. There should be a proper order. It is in the order not in the, uh, no, not anywhere else. So if you keep things in order, that's where the beauty comes. I still remember Sanjay Rao comes and every, uh, sun, uh, every Sunday, he adjusts the chairs. He takes at least 35 minutes to adjust these chairs. Not because they're heavy. He adjusts and checks. Everything is straight or not. Three lanes in the left, three lanes in the right. Each lane should be straight and this lane, line, lane in the left and the right should be parallel. Everything is in proper order. You know, that's how he used to do that. So I guess he is also believing it, keeping in that way is only beautiful. So beauty is in the symmetry. That's what people think. Look at this. Have you ever heard about a perfect rectangle? We know rectangles, right? Perfect rectangle. This is this is called perfect rectangle, okay? You what you this will be like you know. Um, first, you need to draw a square, and divide it into two. One side of it, divide into two. From there, you draw in a half circle, connecting to the opposite angle, and then connect it to the direct what we call it uh, uh, the side which we have divided, and make a. Uh, co connect those points and then will become perfect rectangle and in this the uh, the distance between this point and this point uh, sorry the distance between this point and this point will be 1.6 time to this okay and distance between this point and this point uh, sorry these two lines will be 1.6 time to each other okay so this is the perfect rectangle people talk about okay and all the temple, sorry, all the greatest buildings in the history, they're built in this perfect rectangle shape only. They maintain it. This perfect rectangle is so very important. All the beautiful structures in the history. And even today, see, this is the temple. In the ancient world, they use the same formula, in the same measurements. Taj Mahal also built in the same measurement. Okay? Everything has to be built in the same measurement. Look at butterfly. Beautiful thing. This is also in the shame measurements. So, if you want anything beautiful, according to Aristotle, it has to be according to perfect rectangle. That's what he, he, uh, he said, golden ratio. Golden ratio is 1.6 times of the other side. Okay, That should be the measurement, he says. And can you, why it is so very important? Because they have observed this perfect rectangle, this golden uh, ratio on almost every aspect of the physical creation. If you take a shell, what form it will be? This form, shell. And this is a, con uh, you know, may, many a times we think the earth is revolving around the sun in a long circle, like, you know, eclipse we call it. In that shape it is, but in reality not like that. The earth is revolving around the uh, sun in this form only. Like uh, what we call it, um, tornado, right? Cyclone, tornadoes and all. In that form it is like, that's what we can see on the earth also, weather. 
Okay, anything you take, this perfect golden ratio can be seen. That is the reason the ancient philosophers, um, scientists, magicians, and all um, uh, they they adapted this golden triangle ratio. So according to Aristotle, everything has to be in the uh, in the form. They have to be in the symmetry. Look at this, this beautiful uh, uh, what we call suddenly I forgot forgot the word. Uh, this beautiful structure on the ch on churches. Why is it beautiful? Because each small part is, is sorry part of uh, sorry piece is symmetrical with the other things. Everything has to be symmetrical. I was wondering there are beauty competitions and Miss India, Miss World, which we are talking about. If beauty is something subjective, how can they use a uh, you know measurement to say somebody is beautiful, right? And even for that also, in the world we see, can you see? These lines and all, this rectangle, here also same formula. Perfect rectangle, golden ratio formula they take. The distance between eyes and the shape of the nose, lips and all, they have to arrange it according to this. And if somebody, if people are having in the perfect shape, perfect ratio, then only they consider them as beautiful. If they are not of it, they are not beautiful. That's that, that is what that is how the world is looking at it, and everywhere we humans go, we seek symmetry. Why? Why do we seek symmetry? Very simple, because we like it. It is easy for eyes. When there is a symmetry, it is easy for eyes to understand. And also, we believe the symmetry is a sign of health. If everybody is in proper shape with these lines and all, good. If somebody have something by shape like this, <laughs> do you consider them healthy? <laughs> you know, we have a shape for the body also, triangular shape of the body is the healthy people. And you know, the build should be, uh, sorry, inverted triangle. Shape is the healthy body. This circular body is not the healthy body. So we have a deep sense within us that we believe that uh, beauty is in the symmetry. We seek for the uh, symmetry. And, and beauty has a sense of form and dignity which we are calling this symmetry. If this symmetry is missing, again, we may not like, we may not consider it as beautiful because, let me give you an example. The exam best example we can think about is music. There are six strings in the guitar. Any st does any string sound bad? If a properly tuned guitar, can any string sound bad? No. If you individually uh, strike any string, it will be very pleasant. Okay. If we miss the scale and play the chords, does it sound good? No. If you want to play music, there is a scale and according to that only you have to play. You cannot play, say, a, a, a guitar however you want and say, I'm creative. No. It just that becomes noise. When you create something beautiful, if you want to create something beautiful, it has to go through some form. It has to go through a pa particular pattern. Then only the beauty can come. So that's why we, in order to hear good music, there should be proper order, proper symmetry, proper scale, proper use of the instruments and all. Then only we'll be able to hear beautiful sound. If you want to make any picture, again, there is an order. Once upon a time in the ancient pictures and all, the da, you, know, you know, the pictures uh, painted by Da Vinci, all these kind of ancient people, all of them, they use mathematical uh, ratios, like as I said, golden ratio and all, in order to draw their pictures. And now, in the modern day, this, this is what we are seeing, this we call abstract paintings. But these also have to be in order. In order to explain the meaning or the emotion of this picture, they have to use a certain colors only. Each color reveals a particular emotion. And according to that only, they have to use the colors. It is abstract beauty also, painting also. You cannot simply draw whatever, you know, yeah, whatever you want to strike and whatever you want to do, uh, brush with the brush and can do. No, they have to go according to 
the colors each color carries the emotion and each emotion brought together that can carries a message so then only we can call it as beautiful so beauty requires an order and this order gives the dignity to the beauty and beauty contains order and uh, harmony beauty has a relationship with the truth uh, there seems to be a rightness of forms when you talk about these right forms and our right shapes there is a rightness and everything has to come and fit according to that that's what the beauty says so does it mean everything has to be in order if something is not in this order is not beautiful so does everything have to follow this golden ratio does beauty have to depend on this golden ratio or this system called golden ratio or <laughs> no beauty doesn't uh, subject itself to any system beauty is beyond it i i i, I um, you know i believe i could make some sense to you uh, you know what i am talking the beauty we feel in us sometimes it may not be with the orders and lines and ratios it can be something beyond it and that beauty which is beyond this golden ratio and this order is called sublime beauty so there is one beauty called aesthetic beauty which has to follow the order and there is another beauty called sublime beauty which is beyond ourselves and when we encounter the dynamic and when we had this dynamic encounters with this sublime beauty they are so powerful to move us they will move us they will inspire us sometimes they scare us also um, this is my hometown i'm from sri salem okay uh the depth of this dam is 987 feet okay and uh th that's the depth when they open the gates the gates open at 980 feet or somewhere so the water comes from there and they fall down and again they jump can you see a jump here they jump almost like 400 feet so the water goes down again jumps for 400 feet and fall down and when the gates are open if you are somewhere on this bridge or somewhere you cannot direct, you cannot hear each other so loud voice will be there have you ever been to a place like this when the gates are open <laughs> uh, we had been next time please do come to my hometown for picnic okay we'll take you my brother is working we'll ask some help we'll go somewhere here when the gates are open here when the gates are open here we can go water won't come okay that is a safe place only when we go there the sound of the water scares us to the death it is so loud and you know you will be shaken by the sound itself i'm not talking uh, uh, mentally physically itself you will shake okay the dam itself and that dam will be shaking when uh, gates are open okay all the dams are built with that gap that elasticity so that they may not break okay that's so powerful so if you are sitting in this place you know that will uh, if any poor fellow is there old man is there he can get heart attack also <laughs> you know such a scary place but at the same time when you are there you, you don't like to come back you want to be there and see the water this water actually it's so dirty a red water actually when the fall down color changes they become like milk so white they will be <laughs> but in reality the color of the water will be brown okay so if you go there the sound scares you it captures your heart and it it, it is such a scary thing but still you will love it you like to be there itself and these kind of things are called sublime beauties and these sublime beauties inspires us they they create a sense of awe in us wonder in us and they overwhelm us when we see that we cannot help ourselves but say wow if you said that that means you understood that beauty <laughs> if you did not say that you did not understand the beauty 
so when you go another thing is i previously also might have shared i went to himalayan mountains uh, previously we put up on uh, mountains uh, in the night for four nights uh, thankfully one of the nights was full moon and we got clear sky okay and this uh, the moon was so bright and shining on the mountains you feel like you know moon is so close if you if you climb the next mountain you can you feel like you can touch the moon okay so close you'll feel the sky was clear stars and all are very bright and uh, uh, this the sunlight falls on the white snow and the white snow reflects that light back and literally i'm telling around night one o'clock or two o'clock also you can take a newspaper sit there and read so bright everything around us will be so beautiful it's so beautiful when we when you are there it captures our heart that is something called that is called sublime beauty that's why if you google the word sublime sublime beauty it will take you to all great landscapes or it will show you the pictures of galaxy imagine the galaxy how great how big it is you know the galaxies imagine how where we are in those uh, in that great sky in that galaxy the moment we could get to observe that and see that it captures us and it tells us that we are something we are really it, we we find we feel like you know we are so small in front of it the greatness of this sublime beauty take controls it takes control over us and such a an experience happened to isaiah in isaiah chapter 6 in isaiah chapter 6 isaiah uh, was he got, he had a vision the scripture was read to us by josephin and he has seen the lord sitting on his white throne and the angels were covering their faces and their foot this picture is not very <laughs> accurate but you know the picture very well and the you the picture in your mind makes better sense than this okay the angels were covering their foot and their face and with two wings they were flying and they were praying and praising god hallelujah 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 that is called encounter with the sublime beauty have you ever had this experience this experience is not necessary to you necessary for you to sit at a uh, dam gates this necessary may not be necessarily to be observing the great galaxies this uh, this experience of the sublime beauty of god is not necessary to be looking at the great himalayan mountains it can be a simple experience in your heart where you felt the work of god which transformed your life completely and which made you to follow him people call it born again experience born again experience once only once in life it can come you all may i believe you all may be having some kind of experiences in your life where you felt god so closely and it can be uh, a miracle that happened to you so your heart was filled with immense joy and from way from there your life might have taken a turn or it can be a moment where you prayed and prayed and prayed and your prayer got over and you don't have anything to pray and that's where you felt the peace that passes understanding in your heart which will be given to you by god and which transform your life you might have taken 180 degrees turn and started walking and following the lord that is the sublime beauty that we are talking about moses had this moses went to the mountain sinai mountain and uh, he encountered the burning bush when he saw the burning bush it was so he was so amazed it caught his attention and he was awestruck and when he heard the voice said moses moses where you are standing is the holy land remove your shoes then he understood the holiness of the lord through the burning bush what happened moses bowed down before the burning bush that is an experience of the sublime beauty moses xp moses had such experience and which changed his 80 years of life and he changed and he murdered in a place and ran away from there 
and that particular experience made him even to go back to the same place knowing that his life will be a jeopardy and isaiah had the same experience he had a vision and where he had an experience with god he observed the sublime beauty of god and then what is the immediate thing happened isaiah realized he is a sinner he bowed down before the throne and said i am man with unclean lips and then the lord puts a coal on his tongue and he cleans him and the lord asks who shall who shall go for me that changed Isaiah's life completely. He said, Here I am, Lord, send me. Of course, it's prophetic towards Jesus as well, but in that literal like, uh, understanding of that vision. Isaiah encountered the sublime beauty of God. And, <coughs> Book of Revelation, John, he, he, he has seen the seven seals. And he heard, there is nobody in this world who is qualified to open the seven seals. Only the Lamb of God who is worthy to open the seven seals. And when the Lamb of the Lord came, what happened? John, he fell on the floor. He fell on the floor and worshipped the Lord. That is an encounter of the sublime beauty. And we don't need to have all these dramatic experiences to experience the sublime beauty. There is a very simple experience through which people could explore that sublime beauty. You don't need to get that great light which Isaiah saw. You don't need to find a burning mango tree. You don't need to find, uh, you know, you, you don't need to uh, find the angels coming and just, just like John to hear that majestic voice and to fall down. There is another way God revealed his sublime beauty that is through his son Jesus Christ. And we sing the song, what a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is. I'm telling you, uh, many a times as I read, sang, sang that song, I did not understand that at all. I could not relate to that word. What a beautiful name it is. What is the beauty in the, just the name Jesus? Huh? Because the name of Jesus is not just a name that is the character of God and which revealed his love on the cross. The cross is so beautiful, such a beautiful thing where almighty God, such a great God, creator of all universe has come. He submitted himself to human uh, violence and he died for you and me. John writes in John chapter 1 verse 14, we have seen the glory, glory of the only begotten Son of the Lord. So John did not get this light experience that day. John did not get this heaven experience or this burning bush experience. What he saw is just a man like you and me. A man like you and me. That's where he saw the glory of the only begotten of the Father. In other words, in the man like just like you and me, he, he saw the sublime beauty. You know, when, he, when did he observe that beauty? After the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then when, when the Holy Spirit came upon him, then John realized what is it to be called Jesus. Jesus' name is beautiful. Then G John realized what this life is, who Jesus is, and being such a great God, how he moved with him. Just imagine how would you feel if suddenly a new friend has come to you, you played with them uh, and you played for a good time and all. Later you realize that uh, that friend is a uh, son of the president of USA. Uh, the, when you realize, you'll feel, oh, such a rich fellow, such a great fellow, big fellow, powerful fellow. He played with me just... You know, like a normal person. And you will start seeing the beauty of the person. You know, that is what the disciples have seen. And that is what the doctrine of Trinity teaches us. When we see Jesus as the Son of God, we will be able to understand, observe, and perceive the beauty, the sublime beauty of God. And these, we may not be able to understand completely with the logic. 
the reason i did not try to explain the doctrine of trinity today logically is because no matter what how many how logically philosophically we explain it we still may not be satisfied uh, intellectually but when we could just uh, give some space for a mystery in our rational minds and decide to believe god god is father son and the holy spirit then we will be able to see the sublime beauty of god so beauty depends on the beholder we say sometimes beauty depends on the beholder and sometimes when you believe only you will become a beholder unless we believe we may not be able to behold so for sometimes the logically the doctrine of trinity explains about god it explains and reveals some truth and great truths about god and the it reveals the beauty of god and but still there is a sublime beauty of god which we can perceive when we keep a space for mystery in our hearts the mystery of trinity if we could keep some space in our hearts then we will be able to explore the depths of that beauty that's why i would like i wanted to call this sunday not as the trinity sunday but mystery sunday and this is my prayer that god may grant his grace to us so that we may be able to keep some space in our hearts keep some space in our minds especially in our rational minds for mystery okay whatever is mystery we feel you know illogical so god's grace is required for us so that we may keep some space for mystery when we are able to keep some space for mystery then only we will be uh, qualified and we will be able to get opportunity to be wondered and if you have if you understand the doctrine of trinity or any beauty completely it will be of no fun you know i was uh, you know i was using my phone uh, the first few days of my phone is so exciting you know after few days you it is it must be your experience also what is there nothing i understood everything in the phone i got everything in the phone you don't even feel to open it that's what happens so when you you uh, the beauty of mystery remains as long as it remains as mystery the wonder of the mystery remains as long as you keep it as a mystery and go before it with humility the moment we take everything logically and systemize it formulate it we will lose the very sense of that beauty may god grant his grace so that we may be the explorers of the beauty of god keeping our hearts minds and spirit open to the mystery that he wanted to reveal to us and jesus revealed the truth and now let me tell you we all have a great even bigger opportunity jesus said when the holy spirit he will lead us into whole truth if jesus revealed the sublime beauty and john saw the glory of the only begotten of the father and the holy spirit is going to reveal it even more explicitly that's what jesus said he will re- he lead you into whole truth so we all have the opportunity to explore this beauty and we can do that when we keep some space in our hearts and rational minds for some mystery and for the leading of the holy spirit may god grant his grace so that we may be explored